Our lesson today has to do with God's judgment. Uh, I, I don't know how many lessons you've ever heard on the judgment of God, but uh, they probably tend to just focus mainly on uh, Matthew chapter 25, and that's about it. Well, we're going to mention that at one point in this lesson today, but that's not uh, not what I want you to get. Here's what I want you to get. His judgment is real, and we experience it. And uh, I, I want you to be sure you see that. So and to begin with, judgment itself is a legal thing. You go to the courts and you sit before the judges and they hand down decisions. And so Webster's Dictionary says the act, it is the act or process of forming an opinion or making a decision after careful thought. And I thought about God's judgment in this light and I thought, wow, he has thought about what he's going to be doing with me. And I know that because of all the things throughout history that he has done in preparation for the judgment. It's real on your outline. And I'm going to start off with talking about some things that you know. You know he, and that because he has shown it to you. He's shown you his judgment. So let's look at some instances. First off, Satan is cast out of heaven. That was a judgment that God made. It comes to us in only one place that I know of, and it's Jesus' statement in Luke chapter 10, verse 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now, Jesus says in another place, that Satan was a liar from the beginning. He says he was the father of all murderers. So I don't know what all Satan did in heaven. <laughs> I don't even pretend to know. But evidently from Jesus' statement, there was a time when he was there and he was put out. And Jesus says from the very beginning, old Satan was bad boy. Okay. God's judgment was... Satan, you can't stay here any longer. You got to be get out. And so Jesus says, and I watched him fall from heaven. That's a judgment of God. God also judged that creation was good. There are several times throughout the account of the creation in Genesis chapters 1 through 3 that he said it's good. What I want you to look, Lou, is to look at chapter 1, verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, y'all need to know that back in verse 27 of this passage, he made woman. And it wasn't until after he made woman that he said it was very good. Now, he looked at this, he looked at that, and he said, that's good. That's good. That's good. But after he made woman... He said, it's very good. So ladies, y'all can take that as a compliment. I think he was not just alluding to women in that instance. I think he was talking about the whole of all of his work and all that he had done. Uh, but uh, y'all can have that little funny if you want it. And then Adam and Eve were cast out of Eden. That was one of God's judgments. It comes to us in Genesis chapter 3 and verses 23 through 24. And the Lord God said... Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed in the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. God made a judgment here. You can't stay in the Garden of Eden any longer. you got to get out. Now, historically, we've seen those things, and we understand, yeah, it was God who made that decision. It was his judgment. Remember Merriam-Webster's definition? It is a thought or a decision that's made after careful thought. In every single one of those, God didn't do that rashly. God did that after thought. 
He did that after man had the opportunity in the case of man, opportunity to, to not do that. But he did anyway. And so God saw man's need of salvation. And you know what John 3.16 says. It is because of the love of God that he sent Jesus to die for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In that there's God's judgment and it affects our lives. It's not way out here in the future. It's not way away from us, but it's presently with us. God's judgment. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Folks, that's not there just, just saying that as a, as a statement. But he has just got finished saying, The people who have turned away from God and left him, they are in sin. They are worthy of death. Oh, by the way, you Jews or you religious people, you do the same things. So guess what? You're also worthy of death. And Charlie Kate, you stand in front of the New Bethel Church of Christ and you will preach a Bible lesson and you also deserve to die. It's God's judgment. And this statement in Romans 3.23 is simply a, a culmination of all that he said. More specifically, it comes to us in Romans chapter 3, verses 21, 22, just before that, where Jesus, where it says that Jesus is God's answer to that problem. I have in all caps here on the outline the word but. I want you to listen to it. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. The difference there that uh, Paul is alluding to is the difference between those who no longer believe in God, those who do believe in God, and those who I'm going to call super religious. They're willing to teach a Bible class. They're willing to study intently. And he says in those three categories, there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That includes me. That includes you. We need God's answer to the sin problem who is Jesus. So you became a Christian and God judges you to be innocent of sin. Did you commit the sin? Absolutely. But your sins are washed, what? Away. They're no longer there. And so the Hebrew writer says he forgets. He simply chooses to forget those sins because Jesus took the penalty for you. That is in your life as a Christian, a judgment of God. It is not you doing it. It is not somebody else around here doing it. They may still hold those sins against you. But the answer is that God will no longer hold you accountable for what you did. It is his judgment in your life. And you become a Christian. And so God now judges you worthy of heaven. Now you're not worthy of anything. You deserve death. That's what he said in the first three chapters of Romans. That's what you deserve. But when you get to chapter 6, and he says, You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered you, being then made free from sin, there is another passage that comes into play. For the wages of sin is death, verse 23 says, but the gift of God is eternal life. Because you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered you, which in the first six verses is to be baptized into the Son, son and, the, and His blood, being raised to walk in a new life. Because you've done that, based upon your faith, chapter 5 says, because He gave Jesus as the answer to the sin problem, chapter 3 says, 
then you don't get what you've earned, which the first three chapters says is death. You don't get the wages of sin any longer, but you get the gift of God, which is eternal life. God says, Charlie, you're a, you're a wreck. You're filled with sin. Oh, no, you're not. Jesus just took those away. Now you're worthy of heaven, Gerald. I can go to heaven. I, I can be with God in heaven. And God judged that. That is the judgment of God. And then there's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. Because God has judged you thusly. That passage says that judgment begins at the house of God. And that is what that judgment is. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now, the, I need to put you in the context of that passage. Because just before that, it says, if any man suffer as a Christian, don't let him be ashamed. So it has to do with what people do to you as a Christian. And what he's actually saying in that passage is how the world treats you and how you react to that treatment is being judged by God. And that is a beginning of your judgment as a child of God. And so I go to him as a faithful Christian. That life, those things they've done to me, have already been judged righteous. Because I've gotten forgiveness of my sins through the blood of Jesus, holy. Because I've been put into the family of God who are the saved, heaven and those are the judgments of God. They're not my judgments. They're not your judgments. They're God judging you as you respond to him, come to him, and live for him. Now, I know this is a different lesson on judgment than you've ever heard before. I know that. And I know that some of it may be pretty hard for some of you to follow. I understand that. But it's real. And every day you get up, you are standing before God to be judged by Him. You say, that's scary. No, it's not. That is wonderful. Because by the blood of Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, you can make the proper judgments of what you need to be doing, how you need to feel, and how you need to think. It is a wonderful thing. Judgment is now going on in the house of God. Do you remember what Jesus said about the wheat and the tares? Let them both grow together. And he'll take care of it when a time of reaping comes. He is seeing your good works. He is seeing you're applying the blood of Jesus. He is perfectly aware of your love for him, your care for him, and your striving for him. Trust him in his promises. So then we get to what everybody thinks about the final judgment. Matthew 25, that's where it pictures there's a separation of people and you know there are sheep on the right and there are goats on the left and so on. Do you know what that says? Let's get the meaning. We don't have to dig it out too deeply to get what Jesus is saying. He's saying your relationships to other people matters. 
I don't want to minimize that doctrine doesn't matter. Doctrine does matter. But that's not what Matthew 25 is about. Matthew 25, Jesus never mentions how you become a Christian. He never mentions whether you accept or reject Jesus or not. He never mentions how you worship. He never mentions any of that stuff that we argue about in religion. The only thing Jesus talks about is your relationship to others. I was hungry and you fed me. I was in prison and you visited me. I was naked and you clothed me. All of those things that he goes through. It has nothing to do about what we normally think is important in religion. It has to do with your relationship. And he says that your salvation depends on it. So I want you to put this in your little hat here. God is using you in this world to do his work. Last night, I was down here until about 9.30 last night. And I turned the lights out in here. And you all know how dark it gets. And Don, the street lamp was off out here. And it was dark out there, as dark as it was in here. And I closed the front door and brake lights came on in the driveway here, blocking the drive. I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> so I got my telephone in my hand, <laughs> and I go to the car. I get in, I close the door, I crank the engine up, turn the lights on, put it in drive, and start driving towards it. And that, that truck cranked up and backed up and rolled the window down. Uh-oh. I rolled my window down with a little prayer and said, can I help you? And they said, no, we're waiting on the sheriff. <laughs> we have hit a deer. And we can't find him. And we're waiting on the sheriff. I said, well, can I help you do him? No, no, we're fine. We didn't hurt us and we're okay. I didn't know what that was. And it could have been bad. But just with a little prayer and Lord, be with me. Guess what? It will work out. And even if it doesn't for the church, for the Christian, if it doesn't work out physically and somebody kills you, guess what? It still worked out. Just do what's right and don't worry about what may never transpire because God wants to use you in this world and your relationships and the things that you do matter and will matter at the judgment. One of the things that, you, that he's going to say to the sheep is, Come ye blessed, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Now I don't know what heaven was like before Jesus died. But I know what heaven's like now. It is a place that has been prepared for me and for you as a Christian. That's what heaven is. And the judgment of God in our lives today is preparing us for that, making us ready. And when that final judgment comes, it is no if, ands, or buts about it because the promise of God says... He that believe and is baptized shall be saved. It's a promise of God. Accept it, people. Yes, you're weak. Yes, you sin. But the blood of Jesus, 1 John chapter 2 says, He is your pardon. He is your advocate to go between you and the Father. Chapter 1 says, his blood continually cleanses you from all sin. Accept 
the word of God. Come, ye blessed, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. You've been faithful in serving God, then there you go. You've been faithful in serving mankind, there you go. But both of those are parameters around being blessed in heaven. And you need to understand that. Jesus says it matters. It matters to God what you do. In verse 41, he says then to the goats, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devils and his angels. I used to say, and I still believe, that if you go to hell, you're going to be trespassing. God never intended for you to go to hell. His intention was for you to go to heaven. It comes about in so, some passages like, whosoever will, let him come. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. God does not intend for you to go to hell. But the devil's going to go. And his angels are going to go. And you got to decide who are you. In this passage, we studied in 1 John this morning in chapter 3. And it says that if you do righteousness, you will be manifested as a child of God. But if you do evil, you will be manifested as a child of the devil. Now manifest there means to show on one hand but it is stronger than that. It means to prove. This life then becomes a test of your faith and proof of who you are. The context of that passage has to do with loving your brother. So if you have hatred for anybody in your heart, you get it out. You drop it. Because both Jesus in Matthew 25 and John in 1 John chapter 3 says that's the test of your discipleship. Verse 45 says, Inasmuch as you did it unto one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. I want to concentrate on the two words that are underlined. You cannot alleviate all the pain, suffering, and the poverty in the world. It is impossible. Jesus said, the poor you'll have with you always. He didn't say I had to attack everybody. He said, one. One. You find one person that needs help, you help them. The second thing is the word not. In my relationships that I have with the world, it is as though and exactly the same thing as treating Jesus that way. That has already been judged by God. And how we comply with it and fall into line with it is it has eternal ramifications. So let's bring this thing to a close now. Let's hope you can go home with something. God is looking to forgive us in Christ. He's not looking for perfection. He's not looking for people who don't sin. He made us. He knows us. And he built us the way we are. We are going to sin if we're alive and well. He's not looking for that perfection. But he is looking to forgive us. The Christian's final judgment will be to hear, enter ye in. And I say the Christians because that passage we looked at has already told us that it is manifested, it is shown, it is proven who we are and what we are by the relationships we keep. 
And once we have shown what we are made of, what our faith really is, then we can appeal to the blood of Jesus and we can get forgiveness of the shortcomings and God will bless us. Come ye in, ye blessed. Those to whom God is blessing because of the blood of Jesus. And when you are in that category and you've shown what your faith is and who you are, the only thing you're going to hear is, enter ye in. I know Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive in our bodies the things which ye have done, whether it be good or whether it be evil. I know those verses. Those verses are in opposition in taking a look at what people don't do and how they don't live. I am looking at this morning how you do live. And when you appeal to the blood of Jesus, all of the negative and bad stuff you've ever done, ever said, ever thought has been forgotten by God. And you're not held accountable for it. That's what the Bible says. So let us be mindful of a few things as we close this lesson down. First off, I want you to be patient in your weaknesses. I've had people to tell me, I know God can't forgive me because I'm so wicked. I've done so much. I just keep on. I don't know why. Well, guess what? God knows that. Just be thankful for forgiveness. Lord, thank you. Thank you. And then be filled with joy for the promise of eternal life through Jesus. Filled with joy. I know I don't deserve to be judged by God as forgiven and fit for heaven. It's not because of who I am. It's because of who Jesus is and because I have become his child and because of those things, then he judges me those ways. So what's your judgment like? How will you be judged if you stand before the judgment bar of God? Will it be there's nothing evil on his slate? Or will it be, oh, yes. On June the 16th of 1954, he did. I have a sin in my life that I remember God doesn't. I was three years old. And H. Ray Cox and his wife had ordered from Holland bulbs, tulip bulbs, Donald, from Holland. Do you know how much those bulbs must have cost? Do you know how much care they must have put into getting every one of those bulbs up and blooming? And I, Charlie, go and pick my mama a bouquet of every single one of those tulips. Now, I never did get to tell Ms. Cox how sorry I was. I was three, maybe four years old. I never did tell her, but do you think this old 70-year-old man doesn't remember that? God doesn't remember it. But I am so sorry. And then I think about how ugly sometimes I treat people. And I speak to people. And I react to people. Lord, forgive me. Let us be mindful. We have a great God who loves us, and his judgment is fantastic. <laughs>